Okay. So it's live right now. Let's see who uh, let's get the attendees up. Okay, we have some attendees here waiting. Hello, everybody. Wait for um, everyone to join. Give it a few minutes. Now we'll get started. Jim, I think this is uh, maybe evidence that people don't like to go out in the cold. You're you're on mute. That's that's the saying of twenty two thousand twenty and twenty one. You're on mute. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, So, so Mark Parmalee should be, is actually in the, um, yeah, so I sent him the, yeah, there he comes. Okay, good. Got it. Great. Mark, I think we're just waiting a couple more minutes to see if some more people um, join the audience. Just trying to get Scott Olson on. He's having some difficulty from his home, but he'll be he'll get on. Okay. Uh, a minute or two, and then we'll get started. Uh, okay. uh, Jim, Boy, can you also promote uh, Jim Boys as well? Sure. Uh, it, it looks like David contracts there. And contract is on as well. Yeah. Yep. Got him. Good evening. Thanks. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. How are you? Good. How are you? How's everyone? Good. Hey, there's Dave. Hey, I was like, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, sorry. There was a little technical difficulty with this link to yeah, the link, yeah. One of the links was not going to the right place for some reason. So. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> and I've been having all kinds of technical difficulties all day. So... If I disappear, if I disappear, it don't take it personally. It's just because my um, router went out again. Got it. We had the uh, vaccine seminar today with like eighty people, and it went smoothly. So no, uh, no technical glitches. And then, oh, um, actually, oh, that's right. It was today, today too, right? Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was actually really informative. And then we, uh, the green team, met with Streetworks today, so that was also on Zoom, and that worked out well. Great. Okay. Busy day. I know. Have, um, I think we have everybody here so far. Um, Scott, <coughs> promoted Scott the panelist, who should be joining very shortly. Um, and is, is that Mar uh, Mark Agrippa? Are you there? I'll promote, I'll, I'll promote you to panelist too, if, if, if that's you. I think it is you, yes. Um, I'm here. Scott, okay. Are you on? Uh, uh, you on hey Canada? there. Um, working on the camera part. Okay. All right, that's fine. 
All right. Um, and uh, there we go. All right. Okay. Uh, you want to start, Linda? Um, sure. Um, I'll just, yeah, I was, uh, you want to start off? I, I can just say a few words yeah. and then we can start yeah, I will. off share the screen. I will, and, and then we'll go to the presentation. So, um, Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third annual um, public budget presentation. Um, we started uh, this process a couple of years ago um, to give everyone an opportunity to see before we start the budget process, um, how we did against um, you know, our anticipated budget for the prior year um, and to give people an opportunity to understand a little bit more about how we go through our municipal budget process and then, you know, also, um, you know, let us know things that you're thinking about as um, your priorities for next year so that as we're, um, you know, going through our meetings over the next month or so, we can keep all of those things um, top of mind. Um, so thank you for joining us. We have a um, longer than usual presentation um, to go through with you all tonight and um, our administrator, Jim Gilday and Mark Parmley who is the deputy um, chair for the finance policy committee this year. And I will kind of tag team through the presentation. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I think it might be simpler if we just take questions at the end, um, since, you know, we'll have to promote people from um, being in the audience to being, uh, you know, and look at that. So I think if you could just um, keep track of any questions that you have, we're happy to take them at the end of the presentation. So Jim, maybe we can. Sure, and the, for the panelists, um, <laughs> maybe maybe Mark and and, uh, and Linda, Mark Parmley, Linda, you leave your microphone. Everyone else can mute so we don't have any background noise. I'll uh, start up the share the screen here. Let's do slideshow. I wouldn't see that. Um, are we seeing? Um, What, everyone seeing what I'm seeing here, the uh, the slide and the next slide, is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think you got to go back and click this the slideshow. Yeah, I would just end the slideshow. Yep. And then also people can probably put questions in the chat too. Yeah, but maybe we'll just do them at the end, David. It's hard to... It's hard to keep track of the chat. Yeah. Or if you want to put them in the chat, that's fine. And then we'll go back and go through them at the end. Yeah, that's what I had in mind. Yeah. Just, okay. yeah, so people don't forget. Huh. Hmm. One more time here. Let's see if I can get this to uh, start up here. Jim, you can also make the left column smaller. Yeah, it's almost like a slideshow. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. So, uh, all right. So, yeah, for some reason, it's it's appearing not on the screen, but uh, we can still go through it and and uh, and it's thank God for Zoom. Uh, so, uh, again, as Linda said, this is the third annual public budget meeting for information of how we ended twenty. Some things we know about for twenty two. Or excuse me, how we ended twenty. Things we know about for twenty one. Some things we know about for twenty two, and. Um, I'll let Linda start off with our, uh, our little yeah. background of who we are. Great. Yeah, we thought it would be a good idea to just um, introduce everyone who um, is involved in uh, financial planning um, inside of the town of Westfield. Um, so our administrator, Jim Gilday, um, you know, who was um, just speaking and you can see on the screen, um, is a 27 year veteran of this process with 21 years experience of formulating our municipal budget. So um, clearly someone who has seen a lot of um, uh, ups and downs um, you know, over the years and um, is uh, a, skill, a very skilled um, practitioner of putting budgets together. Our CFO, Scott Olson, who's been with Westfield for the last five years, um, but has 21 years um, experience putting municipal budgets together for a variety of um, towns in the state of New Jersey. Um, I'm not, I, I didn't see um, uh, Warren or Steve in the, in the uh, panel list tonight, but um, we thought it, it was also important to recognize the 
outside parties um, who help us in the town's financials, Supli Clooney, who's our audit firm, and um, Rogit McCarthy, who's our bond counsel. Um, both Warren and Steve have been you know, very um, helpful and professional um, aids to, for us as we go through this process every year and um, think about the things that um, you know, we're facing. Um, I'll give a little bit of background on myself and, the, and our vice chair, Mark Parmalee and Jim Boys and David Contract who um, round out our finance policy committee are also on the, um, on the Zoom call with us tonight. Um, so um, I have been working on the budget. I guess this is my fourth budget that I've been, um, I've had the opportunity to participate in. Um, I, it's uh, kind of strange, but I really look forward to budget season. <laughs> I, um, I've enjoyed getting to know municipal finance um, since I come from, um, you know, a finance background that um, is a little bit different than what most of you are um, familiar with, but um, I also run um, an in international financial advisory firm that focuses on raising capital for companies in emerging markets. Um, Mark Parmalee is our finance vice chair for this year. This is the first year that he's held the position and his um, second year in office. Um, he's a securities litigator for a global law firm and we are very happy to have his um, background in law also um, informing the um, budget process this year. Um, David Contract has um, participated on the finance policy committee for the same years that I've been on it. Um, and uh, you know, bring you know, helps us to think about how we can um, advance all of the um, committee and town goals um, along the way. And Jim Boys is joining our finance policy committee for the first time this year. Um, he is uh, works in insurance and risk. And um, so, as you look at the um, you know the the um, overview of the Finance Policy Committee, along with the expertise of Jim and Scott. Um, we, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about, you know, all of the different perspectives that we're bringing to the budget season um, this year. This is all um, complemented by a number of um, very brave souls who have um, volunteered to um, participate in our Investment Advisory Council, who I'd like to just name tonight because um, we're, we always heavily rely on them. Um, the group actually includes two Westfield High School students, um, Enzo Miserec and Adam Contract. Um, we're always happy to have um, finance um, oriented um, high school students join this committee. So if there's anyone in the audience who knows others who would like to volunteer, we're happy to get them involved. Um, but the other folks who participate in the Investment Advisory Council are Michael Przinski, Adam Wizen, Dominic Murillo, Lou Key, Jay Steiner, Damian Finio. Um, and then I also would like to recognize all of the department heads who are also joining us by Zoom. Um, it's nicer when we can do this meeting in person, like a lot of meetings, because it would give all of you a chance to talk to the people who um, are working so hard to keep all of our town departments um, you know, running as well as they do. And this has been a particularly difficult year for all of us um, to, um, you know, um, you know, face, we face, you know, very unusual challenges in um, running the town. And I have to give a huge amount of credit to all of you. And um, I look forward to the meetings that we'll have over the, um, you know, next four to six weeks as we um, prepare the department budgets that all roll up into our overall town budget. Great. Oh. Yeah, I have to say, it, it sounds like there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen, but uh, it's uh, it, this collaboration of all the, the people who are involved in this budgeting uh, process is really important. And I think it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's why we've been uh, successful in our efforts so far. And as we as we go through this presentation, I, I'm going to um, Jim take the lead on a, on these next two a little bit. But you know, please you know pop in um, and you know make any comments. And then um, I, generally, we're going to ask um, Jim Gilday to walk us through the presentation um, and 
then Mark Parmalee and I will um, make some additional comments along the way, just um, you know, to provide some additional insights and things to what we're trying to get across to you tonight. Um, so we like to start with a pie chart, um, you know, that gives all of you a little bit of better perspective on um, just how small the overall portion of our municipal budget is um, in comparison to um, the overall, you know, tax collections that the that the town does. So, um, as we collect um, taxes from, um, you know, all the residents and you know property owners in town, um, you know, uh, totaling, you know, the over 178 million dollars, the, you know, it gets allocated, you know, into you know different slices. So you can see um, how large a portion the school budget is of the total. Union County, um, the Union County open space tax levy, the, and the library. So, you know, as we look at our municipal um, tax budget, um, it's only 16% of the whole. Um, and then you'll also note tonight as we walk through this, how much of um, the, the, how much of our budget gets eaten up by non-discretionary costs. Um, so things that are basically, um, uh, committed to us or, um, you know, made known to us at, at this time in the year that relate to healthcare and um, the sewer authority and, you know, those things that we just um, need to accommodate uh, as we go through this process. Um, so I think the first thing that's important for us to take a look at is where we were when we approved our budget um, in March or April of 2020. Um, to give you a little bit of context, um, uh, and as you might imagine, we went through most of our um, budget season, which mostly happens in February of every year, not really at all appreciating what was about to hit us later in the year. Um, so very late in March, um, we took a budget that we were ready to present to all of you and uh, made quite a lot of adjustments to it. Um, to account for a lot of unknowns that the pandemic was um, you know, putting in front of us. At that point, we um, fully anticipated that we, by September at the latest, we were gonna be out of um, COVID, kids would be back at school, um, things would be opened up. Um, and so we you know, budgeted in a way um, you know, that we kind of expected things to return to normal starting in September. But even with that, um, you know, what we did to be as conservative as possible is that we actually reduced our um, budgets, our, our expected spending for 2020 by 1.3%. Um, and we did that in spite of the fact that we were facing 2.32% um, of increases in those non-discretionary costs that I mentioned a couple minutes ago. Um, we, um, we projected that our revenues would decline by $1.2 million because of you know, lost parking, lost court fees, um, diminished construction fees, and a decline in investment revenue, all as you know, um, we were seeing um, you know, things shut down and um, you know, not really knowing um, you know, when that, uh, you know, how much of an impact. So we, we cut back as much as we possibly could. Um, we also um, added $175,000 in additional revenue through um, a projected sale of assets to help supplement the, those um, revenues that would normally come in through those other sources. Um, and at the end of the day, the budget that we approved in 2020 delivered a 1.95% tax levy, which was, as you can see, substantially lower than 2.7% inflation rate. Um, the other theme about the budget that we approved last year was reduced spending. Um, so we took out overtime. Um, we took advantage of attrition and personnel. So instead of um, you know, replacing, in some instances, we held off hiring new people. We um, saw actually you know, salaries and wages for the town you know, basically flat at less than a 1% increase, um, you know, despite the fact that a lot of our town employees are um, you know, uh, under union contracts. Um, 
We cut operating operating expenditures in almost every department, um, and we reduced our capital improvements um, that we had expected um, by one point two million dollars by deferring a lot of things into um, twenty twenty one. Um, and then you know what? It's also important to look at surplus um, because as we were um, looking at the budget last year. We had rebuilt our surplus to $11.5 million um, by replenishing by $2 million. Um, and so as we looked at all of these expected um, reductions in, um, in revenues, we, we had to supplement that with $4.5 million of budget that we had saved our you know, rainy day fund, which um, you know, we certainly agreed there was no better time to be um, allocating our rainy day fund than when we were definitely um, looking at a rainy day. Um, so that left us with $7 million in a surplus balance. Um, and then um, uh, a, with a goal, as it says here, to get basically back to about $9 million of surplus. So that's kind of where we stood. I'm going to let um, Jim Gilday kind of walk us through some of the rest of the slides. Um, and then Mark Parmalee and I will um, um, filter in along the way. So Jim, thank you for taking it from here. Great, no problem. Thank you, Linda. And um, yeah, so that just to, to revisit. So this is really, you know, where we were in April of 2020 when we approved the budget for 2020 and the things that we, uh, we did. So Again, the situation analysis, uh, as councilmen have been kind of touched on, but it was a challenging year in 20. Um, very difficult to forecast anticipated revenues. We had to reduce a lot of revenues with the assumptions we knew at the time. Um, and we did a, overall a pretty good job. We, we, we uh, weathered uh, fairly well in 2020, large part to, uh, we had good tax collections, which we'll talk about briefly. And we uh, used our reserves and had some uh, some bright spots, which we'll mention as well. Um, but you know, the pandemic will continue to affect the 2021 budget, even as things recover. Um, you know, because our budget has to be introduced and adopted by March, April. Um, you know, we have to make decisions now that will affect the rest of the year, uh, and we're limited by you know financial, uh, uh, municipal finance laws on certain things. And of course, to date, uh, we haven't got any. Uh, municipal assistance to offset revenue losses. We've been able to apply for CARES Act funding, but nothing from, from the federal uh, at this point. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things, discretionary revenues were lower than anticipated. Uh, at the time, as I mentioned, the extent of the COVID losses were not known in April. We took obviously some very educated guesses, but as Councilman Havig said, uh, at the time we formulated the budget, there was an expectation that we could come out of the pandemic possibly by late summer, early fall. Um, and that was part of the thinking that went in. Of course, we all know that did not happen. Um, so again, impacts on revenues was significant. Um, we're gonna give you some examples in a minute about parking and courts. You can see what the impact truly is. Uh, and municipal so finance requirements um, do not allow municipalities to anticipate more revenue than they collected the year before. Um, and even if there was uh, you know, an opportunity for that, we have to be careful. We want to set, those, set ourselves up for success in the following year. So even if you could um, you know, make a change and do some moving average, if you know you're not going to collect it, you're just setting yourselves up for failure going forward. So we're trying to be very mindful to set ourselves up for, for success in the future years. Uh, and as, as Councilman Havgan mentioned, again, despite all these losses, we'll get into some of them in a minute, um, we still were able to generate $2.5 million back to bring the surplus from $7 million that was in the bank for reserve uh, back to ex almost exactly $9.6 million. So that was very positive in a very difficult, unknown year. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, so we're in, a, we're in a pretty good spot as we start off uh, 2021. Um, so here's just an example of the two revenues you mentioned in the previous slide. Court and parking are, are two examples where, just to give you a sense here. So here's the realized number in 2019, $462,000 for court, $1,689,000 for parking, which are you know re relatively consistent numbers for us previous years, parking particularly. Um, we knew the pandemic was happening. So instead of being able to anticipate 
per court and parking, $460,000 and 1.689, which we might normally do, we reduced that number because we knew there'd be some losses. And so we anticipated less, 338 per court, 1,305 for, uh, for parking in 2020. And you see now what we realized, um, we still had losses less, you know, that were came in less than our anticipated amounts, um, which wasn't that far off. But the number on the far right here, number in red, um, is really the, 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 the um, total loss uh, year over year, if probably you compare the realized from 20 to the realized from 19, just gives you a sense of the volume of money lost in a very short time frame. So going forward in 21, we'll only be able to really anticipate somewhere around, around the area of 220,000 and change for port and 1,016,000 for parking. So again, when you anticipate, don't meet your anticipated amount and come in lower, it's almost a double hit. Uh, and um, so we're going to have to absorb that. Uh, but this is just an example of how quickly this can happen when you shut down commuting, <laughs> you shut down parking, you shut down police, um, being able to interact with the public and then the courts aren't open. Um, it does have an effect. Um, I do want to say one of the positive things that came out of this um, uh, court, for example, uh, despite the pandemic, we were the first court in Union County to run Zoom courts. Um, to get us back up and running. And we will be, I think, one of the first courts to start having in-person courts next month. Uh, and so we're trying to really focus on this number uh, and make sure we can have a success in 21 to exceed the number we realize in 20. So this gives you a sense of how, how it works. Those are two good examples of impacts that we really felt in 20. Um, there were some bright spots though, as I mentioned. Um, we had, you know, the pandemic was interesting. Uh, we took some hits certain places, but everybody was home. Everyone wanted to clean out their house. Everyone wanted to use the bulky waste program. Everybody wanted to mow their grass. Uh, and so and everyone wanted to recycle. And so we had a very good year at the center. We sold more permits than ever. Um, we had a lot of good sales to landscapers, others for mulch and firewood, which makes us money. Um, recycling use was up. Our bulky waste program, which is now year round for the past number of years was a huge success. Uh, a lot of people organizing their homes, their attics, their basements. So that was good for us and good for them. So a bright spot for Conservation Center permits and fees, which was good. Construction department also uh, was up. Um, we, of course, reduced construction uh, anticipated amount. Um, but again, people were home. A lot of work being done on backyards, decks, basements, attics, uh, renovations. Um, so that was good uh, you know, for uh, the town, but also good for the, for the residents. And we were able to accommodate them with, even with staggered shifts uh, and, and, you know, and, and a new schedule, our new construction official did a really great job of making sure those inspections happened in timely fashion as best we could. And we're still managing that, but construction was up. And the last thing, if you remember all last year, most of our council meetings, uh, you know, March, April, May, June, July were focused on um, you know, dealing with the effects of the pandemic and worried like every other community was in the state, would we collect taxes? Would people be able to pay? Would they pay? Can they pay? Very happy to report Westfield has always had a very high collection rate. We've always been at 99% or more, and that did continue in 20, uh, 2020. So that was a, a risk we had, but you know, thanks to residents of the town for, um, for doing it. And of course, everyone who's, who, who uh, the council members and myself included who live here, we all paid our taxes and, uh, and help the town uh, not have losses in those categories. And those right. were some very good bright spots for, for 20. Uh, Jim, before you go on, I think it really um, you know, bears reinforcing um, you know, the, the resilience and the determination of the people who you know, um, help our town run, all led by you. Um, but you know, the, all that work at the Con Conservation Center, you know, thank you to Greg O'Neill for, you know, um, and you know, for his department heads for you know pivoting and um, you know accommodating the ability to do these things that um, you know um, were unusual. Um, and same to Frank Luoso, our new construction official, for um, the same you know kind of can-do spirit in the um, in the construction department. Um, Neil Rubenstein's been doing a fantastic job at leading our you know tax assessor's office. And you know, in the courts, um, you know, we were the first court in Union County to come back up online, uh, figure out a way to you know conduct court online so that we could start resuming those fees. So 
thank you to everyone. Um, it's it's that you know it's working like a team like this that you know helps us get through these times. So well, thank you, Linda. I think just thank you very much for those comments and and in the court, of course, it's just important to mention everyone you mentioned, except for Greg O'Neill, who's been here a little bit longer, but um, Frank Veloso, our construction official, uh, Neil Rubenstein, tax assessor, and Vanessa Tovar, food administrator, all are brand new employees as of last January, February, and March. So they all walked into this pandemic as they started their employment here. Uh, as department head levels. And again, just great um, adaption uh, by all of them. And of course, every other department head too. Another example of that is Greg O'Neill, but the whole public works department, Richie Eubanks and his staff. One of the things we did, the public works committee had recommended this and we were gonna try it. We had a pivot to do all online permitting in the last minute. And it went so well and so smoothly, we're not gonna go back to permits uh, by paper anymore, we're, we're mail. It's, 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 so now it's, it was just, we have some exceptions. Of course, people have issues, but it, it was such a great process. So that's kudos to Richie and Greg and, and the staff of Public Works to manage that. And it was, we have lines out there, but they manage them well. So I guess another you know, thing, sometimes these, these situations uh, create opportunities. So thank you for those comments. And I think, I think it's also important to point out that they were doing this, doing, they were doing more with less so under the COVID restrictions, they were had limited ability to work together. There were fewer people to, to, to perform these tasks in the first place. And so, you know, it's we, I think the town owes a, a great deal of gratitude uh, to these guys to, uh, to for all the work that they've been able to do. Um, something else to, to just focus on um, is surplus use. Uh, Councilman Havia mentioned earlier, you know, I, I, as I, as she mentioned earlier, I've been around here for a little while. Um, <laughs> I've been through some ups and downs and uh, it reminded me of, of the, uh, the recession impact. And I thought it was appropriate to kind of show what, what happened back then and of what's, what's you know, happening right now. Hopefully we can get out of this with, uh, in 2021. But just to give you an example, of course, the numbers are, are much different, but the concept is the same. Um, you know, surplus is used for a rainy day and it's used to make sure we don't have any you know, crazy impacts from unforeseen circumstances. And so, you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12, I really don't like to remember those years, but they were tough years. And um, like we're doing now, like they like did back then, you know, surplus was used strategically to avoid layoffs, avoid, um, you know, major uh, cuts in service and so forth uh, to get through and, um, uh, and, and, you know, bring things back up after, after the recession was over. And it, does, it affects more than the year that you're in. It affects multiple years because of how the process works. So this is an example. You'll see 2009, 10, 11, and 12, while the starting balances were much lower, of course, the use, obviously, percentage uses of those years, there wasn't much choice. Uh, they, they, they had to use that to get through uh, to preserve services and, and avoid layoffs and so forth. So uh, you know, 2012 was a year where we used no, no fund balance because there was really nothing left. Um, after 2012, of course, the years aren't shown here, but things bounced back, revenues were coming back up, and a lot of things came into place. It's just sort of uh, interesting that, you know, here we are, the percentages, of course, are much lower, but our, our balance, our nest egg, so to speak, is much bigger. Um, but the same concept exists. Uh, we'll see what, we get, what the number will end up being for 21, but it will probably have to be a big number again, because we have so many losses in revenue that just cannot be uh, absorbed in one single time frame. And we have to continue to cut expenses and manage uh, not only 20, but prepare for 21, but prepare for 22. So, uh, but just an interesting comparison, uh, COVID impact versus recession impact. And again, numbers are different, but percentages don't lie. They're, um, they're big numbers and uh, uh, hopefully we can bounce back quicker than we did back then. So, but I wouldn't have any comments on this. Yeah, no, I, I think, I, I think, oh, Mark, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna I was gonna point out one thing. I mean, I think one thing that's important to point out is it, it's just the 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 revenue that we generated, or the surplus that we were able to regenerate in 2020, despite the pandemic, was actually greater than what we generated in 2019. Um, you know, obviously we would have generated more. I think going back to slide seven when we were talking about the decrease in court uh, and and parking revenue, you know, the the park those are those are our primary generators of of revenue for the town. I think we made a decision that, 
you know, one of the reasons that parking revenue is down so much is a combination of, um, you know, a reduction. So for example, we extended the period of time during the Christmas season or the holiday season uh, to have free parking in town. And then also all of the different parklets um, and areas that uh, were provided for all the restaurants in town, in town um, and the other retailers for uh, drop off and pick up delivery, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the, the decision to, to, to forego the, par the potential parking revenue was, was driven in, in large part um, to, in order to support, um, you know, the downtown businesses. And so, you know, it, it's, um, th those are the things, that's one of the things with that, that, um, that we're living with at this point. The second thing, Jim, I, I think it really is important to point out, and you mentioned this, but just, and this is something that I just learned uh, last year when we, when I first started this budget process, that, is that, that the municipal law does not allow you to anticipate more revenue than you generated in the year before. And so uh, Jim has, has explained this before, it's basically a double hit. So there's the, the you know, it, we can only generate since we only, we realized in this instance, one point, uh, 1.6 million in, in parking revenue. We can't exceed that uh, in estimating what we're going to uh, generate this year, even though I think we can all reasonably believe that the town isn't going to be subject to the COVID restrictions for, you know, a 10, 11 month period like we were in 2020. Um, the downside is we can't uh, anticipate that revenue. I mean, the upside though is hopeful, obviously, that we can exceed that um, that anticipation, because hopefully that um, we're going to believe that the uh, um, that we're that, that that the return to norm normalcy uh, is something that's going to that's going to be able to occur, and that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. So. Okay. Okay. No, okay. So um, just this is as a list. I'll have Linda and Mark chime in as well, but you know. All the things we just went through were the losses, were the tough things, how we fared, what we did. Uh, there were a lot of things that were accomplished in 20, um, despite the pandemic. And, uh, and, and we mentioned before, you know, the, the, the employees, the staff, the council, um, the public, um, a lot of interesting things and good things happened. These are a list of them. I won't go through all of them, um, but uh, things that strike me, we, we did receive $833,000 in pursued grants. Um, which uh, obviously are, are very good and some benefited us in 20, some will benefit us in 21. Um, public works still, even in the pandemic with restrictions, is able to plant 500 trees. Some towns don't do that in a year normally. We're obviously usually much more than that, but those are just some things. We had some park improvements um, in Mindewaska and Tamako Sycamore, the playground. Tamako's had some uh, picnic pavilion improvements. Mindewaska and the pathways are finally done. Um, uh, some landscaping around all of the uh, the uh, playground area. Uh, a lot of things happen. These are just small examples, but I think you know the the big thing which um, continued during 2020 was significant progress on the downtown redevelopment plan, the redevelopment as a whole, um, and that continues. And th they're just you know that's understanding that and how important that is is important for the future. And we'll get into a little more about that in a few slides from now. But um, that is continuing and and planning for the future to create more revenue opportunities is, is critical. So those are my high points. I don't know, Linda or Mark, if you have any thoughts. I, 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 would, I would just um, like to say that um, look at, this is just a small subset of a list of things that the mayor put out in her you know, um, annual um, you know, state of the town address um, that she gives in January um, at our reorganization meeting. Um, you know, we picked these things out in particular because they, you know, had to do with, um, you know, finan more financially oriented things and things that impacted the budget. But um, if you look at this list and you look at the list in, you know, the, in the greater context, um, you know, the thing that is really amazing uh, about the town of Westfield is how, you know, everyone has come together um, to, you know, face all of the challenges that our businesses were facing, that, um, you know, health, you know, challenges that none of us you know, had ever, you know, experienced before. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, we put a We Love Local, you know, campaign together out of nowhere, you know, through, you know, the generosity of, um, you know, Johnny Resnick, who, you know, offered to, um, you know, to spearhead that. 
um, and made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, that all went back into our system. Um, and so, you know, yes, you know, they're, uh, you know, I, I think we've talked tonight about, you know, thanking the, you know, all the people who serve on the council and all the people who work really hard to keep this um, town going. But, you know, it's also a thanks that goes out to every single one of the people in this community, um, because we've all really gotten through this so far together. And as Jim said, we don't know when it's going to end. Um, so we're, you know, going to be cautious about how we, um, you know, budget um, going forward. We feel great about the, um, you know, about the level of surplus that we have still as a protection. Um, but this, these kinds, of, looking at these kinds of things, um, and what we've all, you know, done together in a need that in a year that required a lot of pivot, um, is uh, is quite heartwarming. Okay, so um, so that's a quick sort of a recap of 20 very quickly. So we move to 21, um, this is a reminder of just how the budget process works. Uh, we'll talk about this in a second, but we do always do a, a capital plan this year. Uh, late last year, we started planning. We're, we're sort of tweaking how we do our process, um, not only for road paving, but just how we do capital planning and we'll have more to roll out there. Uh, on that in February. Uh, but that's Jim, Jim, I'm just going to interrupt for a second because I think because one of the things that we did do um, a lot of last year was planning for the future. Um, you know, while we um, did were, while we weren't traveling, <laughs> taking vacations. Um, so you know, um, you know, I think one of the things that's really it, this enable has enabled us to do is you know focus on um, you know what we need to do to around the redevelopment and, you know, also focus on a larger basis, what the capital plan is across, you know, um, you know, all of the departments um, in the past, it, or in the recent past, it's been, you know, more focused on, you know, heavy equipment that, you know, costs a lot of money inside the DPW, but, um, you know, we've really, you know, put together a really solid, um, you know, six year, you know, oh, six year plan, but one that we know exactly what we're doing in the next three years, um, which is, you know, exciting. Yeah, no, that's a good point, and that's that's something that'll be rolled out publicly in February. But that's so that's that's in process now. Uh, the department budgets, as Linda mentioned, uh, we've been working on those uh, obviously for a little while. Um, we just are wrapping up now uh, with the CFO Scott the auditors, where we ended up all the details, some of which we're sharing tonight, of course. And then, um, as Linda mentioned, starting uh, really Saturday morning, <laughs> and the next number of, of weeks the uh, meetings with the department heads with the finance committee uh, to go through their specific department budgets and what they need and what we can do for 21, uh, consulting with the auditors and bond council if necessary. And then of course we have the, uh, the, the expe expected timeframes where the committee will be recommending to the council uh, based upon state required guidelines for budget introduction and adoption. We usually have a, uh, we're expecting to have a uh, presentation from the council or the committee to the council on March 9th with the proposed budget. Uh, council had a few weeks to review, and then there'll be the formal uh, budget presentation and introduction to the public, advertised hearing um, on March 23rd, and then uh, under the law, uh, April 20th would be the expected adoption date. Last year, we had the same idea. Of course, that got thrown off, and the state allowed all communities to uh, extend their time frames to revise their budgets. This year, we don't expect that to happen, so uh, we'll be sticking to these time frames. So uh, that's um, that's been happening and what's going to happen in a number of next, next number of weeks. Um, and I think just overall, I know this is something that we've shared every year uh, between Linda, the mayor, and the council, what, what the strategic drivers are and continue to be for um, for you know budgeting for the town of Westfield, continuing to strengthen communication capabilities. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, prioritize infrastructure and safety. We'll talk about that as well. Enhancing service and operating efficiencies. We'll talk about that. Improving economic development and tax rateables. We just we talked about it a little bit already, the development planning going on. And then of course, overall, this is all under the umbrella of demonstrating fiscal responsibility, which we continue to, to, uh, to try to do. So uh, those haven't changed really the past few years and we don't expect them to change going forward. And we'll have some details on those uh, in the next few slides. Um, so, so 21, 2021 budget goals, uh, again, you know, continuing responsible fiscal management, have to continue to manage spending. 
strategically utilize the surplus to continue essential services, manage COVID-19 impacts, which are continuing right now, and, fin and, and also managing the final tax rate. Uh, again, as, as Linda mentioned um, earlier in the presentation, um, surplus use obviously is, is critical when, you, when all the pieces come together. There's a lots of you know, mechanics of how municipal budgets work. And the council has a choice to obviously try to manage the tax rate. There's a, there's a required not to exceed 2% levy cap. That's the levy. And of course, then, that, then you have a tax rate. What, what actually comes out of your pocket? So we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's important, you know, the town's property values are very strong. And we had a big increase in values due to a lot of work by our tax assessor's office. And so even if we have a... Um, you know, a higher uh, tax levy for a lot of different reasons, the tax rate may be less out of your pocket because we have strong property values. So some that continue to, to watch. Um, we're going to continue to aggressively look for new recurring revenue streams. And this is something we, we've been doing. We have lots of um, irons in the fire, so to speak, uh, for 20 and looking, 21 and looking to 22. So um, we're really looking to make sure we don't uh, um, have any major uh, fall offs or have things coming in that can help us for 22. Uh, prioritizing opportunities to increase and diversify the tax base. Again, planning and looking to do things in the future to increase rateable, increase those property values, keep them going up to uh, lower the tax rate. Um, prioritizing downtown economic recovery. While we're talking about our budget here, the town council also approved the downtown Western Corporation budget, which is a component of the town's overall budget. It's not part of the budget directly, but it's a special district tax that goes on in the downtown. So that's a critical piece as well. The downtown needs to continue to help. And as Councilman uh, Parmley said before, we did what we could do, parking, uh, you know, uh, flexibility and so forth. We need to do a lot more than that, uh, more uh, of that for 21 to continue the success of the downtown. Infrastructure improvements, public amenities, roads, parks, recreation, the arts, and uh, et cetera. So we have a lot of things still in the, in the, uh, in the hopper, which will be great. And of course, tonight, after the presentation, we're looking for input, um, you know, suggestions, recommendations to see what we can factor in, uh, something that we may not have thought about. So that's part of what the end of tonight is, is about. Uh, so um, those are the goals. We have challenges already. <laughs> it's not the end of January yet, and we already have challenges, So, uh, which is a normal process for any budget year. So we have non-discretionary expenses for 21 so far that we know about exceeding $700,000. These are things made up of things like the Railway Valley Sewage Authority costs, increased pension costs, increased insurance costs, although we have some good news on insurance, much better than last year. Um, the reserve relative to taxes and capital improvement fund. Um, just one mention about the reserve relative to taxes, otherwise known as RUT. Um, so the reserve relative to taxes, because we are the tax collecting agency, we collect taxes for the county, the school, the library, and ourselves. We, not the school and library or the county, we have to put a reserve in our budget because if we do not collect the taxes, we still owe everybody else their money, whether they collect it or not. So that's a big impact. That's a, you know, over a $2 million number every year, two and a half million dollar number. So just something to, but that's a statutory thing we have to have. It's a requirement. So it's just a non-discretionary expense. So it's just something to be mindful of. Um, the challenge of course is always weighing the, you know, what are the costs of the services we provide? public safety services, curbside leaf collection, curbside recycling, which we had to go out and negotiate. We had an increase, but not as big of an increase as we could have had. So that's a positive thing, but still an increase. Conservation center, other things that we do, always mindful and discussing what, um, what the cost of those items are and how we continue to provide them. Uh, we have a PBA contract, which is still not settled. We hope to get that done very shortly, but we have to make sure we're um, covering increases for that. Uh, we have to continue to focus on further reduction in expenses across the board to avoid furloughs and, furloughs and layoffs and just uh, you know, avoid cutting services where we can. And lastly, um, things we don't control. I mean, surplus we do control, um, but miscellaneous revenues and state aid, um, you know, those are things that uh, sometimes we have our control. So we have to make sure we're mindful of those. So those are the, a lot of the annual challenges, but really the main thing right now, we do have a concrete number so far with $700,000 uh, so far, and, and probably some more to come, and that doesn't even include contractual obligations yet. So, um, as you can tell, as we said in the beginning of the presentation, um, you know, there's a, usually a big number that the council doesn't get, get, get a chance to control. Um, so, one of, one of the good news things is our debt service is very well managed. Uh, 
thanks to the you know, council and of course the bond council we have. So we can, last year we had to take a, a break because of the uncertainty in the marketplace and with COVID on really doing a normal capital budget. We did get some roads done and we had some roads done by Elizabeth Town Gas, our utility partner, but really took a year off because uh, we had to make sure we were uh, financially sound. That did happen. So we are now going to move quickly uh, on a capital budget for 2021, which includes, of course, road paving. And of course, uh, our partnership from a couple of years ago has worked very, very well, where we are going to schedule roads we want to do. And then Blizzard Town Gas has done what they're going to do, and they now are required to pay curb to curb uh, for the length of their, of, their, um, of their work. And we're partnering with them. And again, it's just important to note that um, these are roads paid at their expense. And we're also really for the first time is we were able to really use it last year using the assessment report we did. And that's been very helpful behind the scenes and that'll be actually rolled out in February publicly to uh, you know, give the public information about how we're going to approach the road program we're using the assessment report and partnering with the utility company to be as efficient and effective as possible, but also getting the worst roads done as best we can in a timely fashion. So our goal is to not only announce what we're going to do in 21, both us and the utility company, but give you a preview of what we think is expected to come in 22 and 23 for road paving so people can plan and understand what's coming. Um, so that's gonna be a major change and I think a very positive thing. Uh, drainage improvements will be included in the capital budget, park improvements, furnishings and so forth, public safety improvements, equipment um, on a smaller scale, but yeah, nonetheless, we have to continue that. And technology enhancements, we are, finalizing with the volunteer committee, the technical advisory committee, so the final upgrades to the council chambers, which obviously helps the council when they come back to meet there, the court, planning board, board of adjustment, other you know, historic preservation. Uh, so some AV and technological advancements there, we hope to actually implement in 2021. Uh, um, so in addition to that, uh, there are other prepaid, prepaid projects that were done in 20 um, and uh, haven't been done yet, but will be done in 21. We will see progress. So the website was paid for last year. Uh, we actually applied for some CARES Act money on that. We think we'll get some money back reimbursed to us, but um, that will be launched expected in March this year. And that will be a new platform, much easier navigation, new opportunities for uh, messaging and so forth. Just a lot of you know, not user-friendly items. So that's something that we've been planning for a while to be announced in March. We have six EV charging stations, which were taken care of last year to be installed this year in three of our parking lots. We have new traffic lights going in after many years of planning, new traffic light at Lambert's Mill and Raleigh, and also a replacement for the blinking light at West Broad and Scotch Plains, both in partnership with Union County, who actually applied for a grant on our behalf years ago. And now they'll be able to use that grant to implement those two public safety items in 2021. And lastly, just continue uh, enabling uh, online signups with uh, with our department heads who are working on things such as uh, you know Frank Veloso in the construction office, online permitting there, looking for parking permits, dog licensing, those type of things to be done online as we go forward in 21. Um, and so again, there are some opportunities we talked about before briefly, but it's important to mention that again we really uh, anticipate uh, as as we all hope and anticipate. Uh, second half uh, recovery this year. Um, and we're hoping as, as Councilman Plumley mentioned earlier that we have to you know, anticipate reduced numbers, but we are very uh, hopeful that we'll be able to exceed those numbers, which then give us a benefit in going to 22. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, CARES Act money. While every town did apply for the things that they had to get reimbursed for in 20, really no one's received a lot of that money uh, in, in year 20. So what will happen is we will collect the money we are eligible for in 21, it will reimburse the expenses we had in 20, but then that money will become surplus in 22. Uh, and so that's another thing that we already know is gonna be a positive thing for us as we move forward at 22 and creating some revenue source there. And again, just again, we look budget projections, do look strong and rateables. I just wanna mention rateables for a minute. Um, again, due to the work of the assessor's office and um, and, and, and the town attorney's office with, with appeals and so forth. We have a major rateable increase for 21 budget, which is helpful to the final tax rate. And we're gonna to try to see if we can continue that process 
as we go forward. Uh, and that's a critical thing um, to, again, manage a tax rate, keep property values strong. So we think there's a lot on the horizon. We have some new projects coming on board that are already being built, such as a new project with a traffic circle. That'll be something that will come on the tax rolls in 21 and benefits in 22. So um, some things to look forward to there. Um, so- Jim, Jim yeah. I'm sorry, if we, if we can just go, I, I just wanted to add a couple of things, um, you know, as we are looking at opportunities, because in addition to the things here, um, you know, um, as we're going through every, um, you know, budget, every department level budget meeting over the you know, next four to five weeks. Um, and uh, this uh, finance policy committee and Jim and Scott Olson will meet with everyone. Um, you know, we're emphasizing to them, you know, where, where can you save money? Where can we find new revenues? Where can we plan for the future for shared services or other ways that we can you know, put permanent you know, cost reductions in place? or you know, find um, ways to diversify our revenue stream. Um, so that comes you know, as part of the, you know, the redevelopment ideas and um, you know, just a, a lot of longer term plans um, because even though 2021 will be difficult because of our inability to anticipate more than we've received in 2020, um, there's a, we'll be kind of planning for 21 and 20 and 22 at the same time as we go through this process because there are a lot of um, you know um, things that make sense for us to really think about at the same time. So it'll be an exciting um, budget process this year for sure. It's very dynamic. Yes. <laughs> um, no, thank you, Linda. That's great. And again, just as Linda said, it's going to continue to be a challenging year because the effects of COVID are not over. Um, and we have to recover from that, but we're going to plan accordingly. And again, uh, as we mentioned before, these kind of things, when you look at what we really depend upon, uh, parking revenue, court revenue, construction revenue, um, those are things that we have depended upon for years. And those are important factors, uh, miscellaneous fees and permits. Um, but if, as we know now, <laughs> when you're in a pandemic, um, you can't rely upon those. And we don't have many other places to go. And so um, this, again, reinforces the fact that future, it's not going to happen overnight, but future development and future um, other you know, mechanisms that are out there really need to be looked at hard because we need to create other revenue sources that do not exist right now. So we're not so reliant upon parking if we want to give away parking where we have another pandemic. So um, just important that that continues to be a focus for the future of the town. Um, so... Again, this is the end of the presentation. It's just one thing I'll mention, I'll turn it over to Linda's and Mark as well, but the, the, the address you see here on the screen, the budget at westfieldnj.gov, that's our annual budget address. Um, reminder what that does, if you email that address, uh, we will obviously uh, make sure to answer your question. Uh, and then at the end of the budget process or mid budget process, we then post all the questions and answers that have been posed and answered as FAQs during the budget process. And they become something that goes on our website permanently. You can look at previous year's questions and answers as well. So that will start as soon as we get our first emails and begin to uh, answer questions as we go through this process. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. And um, you know, we're obviously happy to answer whatever questions we can tonight. Um, what we'll do is um, you know, keep track of them and also add the Q&A from tonight into that same FAQ document. Um, and then this presentation will be posted on the town website as well. Correct. Let me, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I haven't been able to see uh, the participants list because I, my screen was kind of blocked there. But um, so again, this is the time that people want to have ask questions. You're more than happy to do that. Raise your hand virtually. We'll, we'll call upon you and uh, you can ask your questions. If we have the answer, we're more than happy to answer it. If not, we can get you an answer. Uh, but if anyone is uh, interested in asking a question, I'm um, more than happy to do that. We'll wait a minute or two. We have the first question. Uh, Sean Mullen. Sean, are you there? Uh, I'm here, Jim. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, first of all, I, I wanted to thank everybody for the for the presentation. Very informative this evening. And, and it's also demonstrative of uh, how we continue to be served uh, here in Westfield by a uh, well served by a uh, a very dedicated workforce. So I, I wanted to thank Jim Yu and, and the rest of the professional staff uh, in town for the work that they're doing to 
to manage uh, to manage this process, right. and also for the members of the committee for the work that they're doing uh, to keep things going here. I had a couple of quick questions, uh, which I'll just I can just pose them all now, and, and you can answer them at, at your convenience. Um, okay. So it doesn't you know you can manage the uh, the, the time properly. Uh, the first question I had was with regard to uh, our town's legal expenses. So I, I know that's a, a significant item within the budget, and I just wanted to see how that tracked in 2020. If that's something that went over budget. Uh, or if that's something that uh, an area that needed to be increased. I know there's been a lot of litigation in town um, on various matters, and I just wanted to see how the legal budget was shaping up because uh, that's you know probably at least you know the the size of uh, some of the money we lost in in um, the court budget. You know just to see how that's tracking. The other thing was uh, related to uh, pilots. I know pilots are going to be uh, an important thing in the budget moving forward, just from uh, a lot of the projects that have been uh, publicized. And I was wondering how, sort of what the relationship was with the school board, uh, seeing how those, you know, the school money is usually undetermined uh, when we put pilots together. I wanted to see sort of what the process is, or if you could walk, walk us through the process of how we're deciding, you know, what portion of that pilot money gets to the schools. Uh, if there's a certain percentage that you guys have in mind, uh, because I think the money we would lose, um, you know, on the municipal side of the house or the money we gain on the municipal side of the house, we might lose on the municipal side of the, on the uh, school side of the house. And if we would, you know, be subject to, you know, them increasing our taxes, they'll increase the school taxes rather than the uh, municipal ta taxes, excuse me. Um, and then the last thing um, was, I wanted to know what, what's the total debt the town carries right now? Is there a figure that you, you know, that you guys have? Do we have 14 million in debt? You know, I know we, we track a lot on the surplus, but how much does the town actually owe in debt? I think that's a, just a pretty simple one. So um, that, that's really all I have. And I, again, appreciate the time and the work you're putting into this. And I look forward to hearing back from you. Okay. If, if it's okay, Linda, I do have answers I can provide. If, if, if yeah. Right now, I think that those are good, good questions, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, they are. Uh, so real quick, on you know, legal expenses, I mean, some of the questions you've asked are a little premature. We are still formulating the budget. I can tell you that uh, on the legal expenses, we do not expect that the uh, budget for 20, uh, one, or 2020 will be overexpended. Uh, it'll actually come in right and will be budgeted or a little bit lower. Um, and most of that is due to, uh, we mentioned this at previous council meetings, I think, but um, we've been uh, able to be reimbursed uh, and create an escrow account for a lot of the expenses we've had for some of the, the legal development work that have been going on either by town attorney or higher professionals. So happy to report that we've gotten um, quite a bit of money back for the work that we've done. So again, right now we'll have more to share once the budget is finally formulated and introduced, but it looks like the legal budget for 20 will come in right at the number or a little bit less than we actually budgeted. And for 21 is not looking like there's gonna be a major increase there at all. That's how it's looking right now. In reference to pilots, they're great questions to ask. It is really premature. We don't have any pilots right now. Um, we uh, um, obviously we, we've had um, uh, some interest in pilots, but your question is a good ones. I know uh, I had our CFO attend a pilot seminar last week to, to make sure we as a staff understand even more details of it. So uh, some of the questions you're asking, we're gonna ask the same ones, but um, would trust me, and I know the mayor would agree with this, and I know the council members will, it's gonna be a very open, transparent process. But yeah. right now the question you have is, is, is actually just premature. Uh, and lastly, in reference to debt, um, so uh, a good news report, I don't have the exact number I can get it to you. I know our CFO is online, but um, we have um, what they call statutory debt, which is the funded or unfunded amounts of money that um, we have for previous projects and so forth. It's probably in the neighborhood of $20 million. To give you a sense of perspective on that, Sean, um, a town like Westfield, uh, would legally be able to carry by the state of New Jersey's law about $250 million of statutory debt. And let me repeat that, about $250 million of statutory debt. So our debt uh, load is very, very low. But that being said, this council and previous councils are very mindful of what that debt service, what that debt level is and what our annual debt service is because debt service in the budget affects the actual budget year. As you mentioned on one of the slides, while we were, were going to be able to move forward with the capital budget this year to do road projects and so forth, the impact of any authorizations would not hit the budget till the following year. 
and we're mindful of, of making sure that whatever we do this year, we can absorb next year or working with bond council, making sure we're, we're managing the debt service so there's no spikes up or down for that matter. So just something to know. And we've also, we also look out multiple years to see when the next drop off is going to be for debt service that's already set. So all good questions. And hopefully those answer your questions. If you have more, feel free to email us uh, at the email address. Anyone else, any other questions? We have another, we have Bruce. Hello, Bruce, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, Bruce. Okay, hi. It's uh, Bruce Morrow. Uh, uh, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you, uh, members of the council, and, and uh, you know, also uh, Scott. Um, I, I guess I have a couple questions. One, is, is there? You, you showed a, a slide up there that was interesting. The 2008 to 2012, that there was a higher percentage of the surplus. Now, it was a lower surplus, but a higher percentage of it was used um, during that period of time, which is, you know, right around the, you know, the, the housing crisis and the, you know, big recession and everything else. Um, was that, was there a corollary there between the, like, was there a drop in taxes collected during that period of time? Because the thing that I'm trying to kind of understand is we, we basically didn't see any drop in taxes collected for, for 2020, which is, that's an amazing statistic considering how much pain you've seen or a lot of this country face in the last year. But um, so maybe you could just answer that part of the question and I have a, a follow up to it. So uh, yeah, I mean that, so in those years, the recession years, I was referring to them 9, 10, 11, 12, no, there was not a drop in taxes. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the tax rate those years actually was probably higher than it was, would be now. But remember, it's, it's, uh, the rules were different back then. Um, there was no 2% levy cap. There was a 4% levy cap. Um, there were different regulations. But no, surplus use doesn't necessarily mean lower taxes. Um, well, surplus use is one component of what the revenue sources are to help manage the tax levy which is then divided by whatever the rateable number is for the town to cre create the tax rate, which is the number that comes out of your pocket. So um, it's not a direct corollary surplus to tax rate, um, but it's a component of it. But in those years, um, there were higher tax increases um, just because of how the rules work. These years now, for the number of years, we have a 2% tax levy. Uh, we can go above that. Many Every town can, but you have to have either use previous years of money that was on spent called cap bank. Uh, you have to have exceptions that go beyond that, such as pensions or health insurance costs, for example, that are beyond 2%. Um, a lot of moving parts, but there was no uh, reductions uh, uh, due to surplus use directly. Okay, thank you. It, it does seem that, I mean, it's a pretty dramatic number of surplus used from six years ago years ago to now if what i'm hearing is that the taxes collected were either the same or more back then so i guess one of my questions is is there a is there a general statistic available of kind of year over year how much and I understand that we're having these shortfalls because of parking and court and, and you know, you make a very interesting point about our reliance on certain things that we never thought would be impacted. Right. And then all of a sudden there's nobody going to a parking garage anymore. And you know, all those things which are tragic, but I'm just curious about that. Well, I, I was going to just answer. I, I think you know, I missed part of what you said. I think I got cut out, but I think um, this important note, and this is uh, it's important. Um, Surplus itself is generated by very specific um, items that really have no bearing on taxes um, or, or what we collect. Surplus is generated, uh, for example, um, part of our surplus is generated from the school budget. And you know what their school budget does versus what we didn't do. I know that seems kind of strange, but it's, it's just the way that municipal finance works. Part of our surplus is generated from excess tax collection. So if we have excesses, that can go to the bottom line 
but it's also um, reduced by potential tax appeals. So that's a very volatile number year to year. And then lastly, surplus is also generated by um, you know, uh, expenditure changes or expenditure savings in previous year's budgets. So it's what's called appropriation reserve lapse, where if at the end of 20, we have, uh, a, you know, hypothetically $500,000 we didn't need to use in 20, it then becomes surplus in 22 after the full year of all the expenses. So surplus is generated by some interesting categories. Um, and it, it's, it's, um, so there's no statistic directly that correlates surplus to <coughs> tax rates, but um, but I, I think that does that answer part of your question or some of your question? It it does answer part of my question. I, I guess I, I guess what I'm just kind of thinking is we we've used a very large number. You know, we can talk at a different time about percentage of the surplus, but we've used a very large number of that surplus, and I'm just trying to figure out like if there how the percentage of spending has gone up over the last few years, because th there's definitely been a conscious decision to, to spend three, 4 million each year of the surplus. I, I know there's been efforts to, to also replenish part of it. And, you know, it's, but it, over the last few years, what's that trajectory look like of actual spending? So, so we'll see in, in, a, in, a pre, in a future, when we have the budget formulated, usually when we do our budget presentation, when we introduce in March, there are many slides, you go back and look at slides just from previous presentations where we show the trend of spending over uh, a number of years um, to compare um, you know, how much we're spending versus how much uh, we're, we're getting in revenue. So we can go more into that if you want to talk offline, but there's some stuff on the website now which shows spending increases and decreases for that matter over the many years as well as uh, the, the revenue opportunities. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can I, Bruce, if I, if, I, if, if I can just jump in here, um, I think the, the other thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, we've made, you know, very informed decisions, you know, at, in each budget um, process, um, you know, trying to balance um, out for a number of different um, outcomes. One, to maintain um, what we think is an adequate amount of nest egg or you know um, rainy day fund for things like a pandemic where we might need some extra money, um, but at the same time understanding that that money that sits in that surplus is the money of all residents in town, um, and you know it doesn't really make sense for us to hold a lot of excess money on the sidelines when our um, collection history is so strong. Um, because if we if we do that and we don't spend it on the things that we need to make investments in, you know, in new equipment and new roads and those kinds of things, that that just means we have money sitting earning, you know, two and a half percent when we could be putting it to good purpose um, and you know um, not you know increasing the tax rate to the residents. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different factors that we're trying to balance in the process, but. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be good fiscal stewards and make sure that, um, you know, we appreciate the fact that the money that's sitting there is yours and mine and everyone else's in town. Um, and um, I think all of us would prefer to have that money in our own pockets um, or being spent on things that improve the quality of life in Westfield than just sitting on the sidelines. Um, okay. Can I, can I add one other thing? Um, uh, Bruce, just I think one other thing that the what another context point, which wasn't in tonight's presentation, but will be going forward is how have taxes shifted? Because really, and Jim said this, the surplus is really helpful, you know, from for from a council perspective to think about ultimately what is what kind of tax rate do we want to have residents absorb? So if you go back over the last three years, including 2020, the average tax rate has been 0.8%. Uh, that is really one of the primary user, uh, pri the, the, the primary reason why we could do that is we consciously invested some of the surplus because we felt like it was too high and, uh, and municipal budget experts said to us it was too high and not necessary to Linda's point. You know, we're just holding on to residents money sitting in at the time it was sitting in an online savings account making less than 1% interest. So we consciously said, let's use some surplus bring it down, but still to a reasonable level, but keep the tax rate low. And that 0.8% over the last three years 
uh, is far lower than it's been if you look at the historical tax rate in the town. So that's really, that, that context is missing. So it looks like a lot of surplus has been, in, has been spent. I would argue it's been invested to both in infrastructure as well as in equipment and making the town better, but also to keep taxes far lower than they've been. And that's the, that, that was really a driving force of some of the decisions we made. So uh, we'll share all that detail, you know, as we move forward, but just a few numbers for you to know. Uh, in 2018, which is the first year that Linda and I were both on the finance committee, taxes only went up a half a percent, the municipal portion, again, far lower than the years before. 2019, which was the revaluation year, taxes were flat, 0%. Um, and then last year, you know, because of the uh, COVID, because of the expenses we talked about and the revenue hit, taxes did go up one point, I think it was a nine or nine five, one point nine five percent It averages out to 0.8. If I recall, the tax increase of the prior three or four years prior to 2018 was 1.7%. So this was more than half lower. So that's the big reason why the surplus has been invested. Okay, well, I guess my last two points would just be, I would hope that now that we've kind of entered a new realm of, of history with this, this pandemic, and there's a lot of health experts that sadly don't think this is like a one in a hundred year thing. Like there could be more of this in the future. I would just hope that this would be, I'm sure it is, there's a lot of smart people that I'm looking at on my Zoom screen right now, that it, it will be factored in to what really a rainy day fund is supposed to mean. I think we always thought about it as, oh, it'll be another Sandy, we'll need money for Sandy. But now it's, who knows, right? So that, I'm sure is something you guys are all talking about. You know, what's the new world now look like with surpluses? And then the other part of it would just be there was one thing that I saw, I mean, I heard in this conversation was, you know, the idea of expanding and diversifying our tax base. Um, uh, I'm, I'm always for diversifying our tax base. I, I think I've just, I get a little concerned and I'm, I'm sure other residents may get a little concerned when they hear about expanding. Um, and I guess it would just be the hope that um, you know, we do our best to, to continue to kind of have that hallmark of the town where we, we're not one of those New Jersey towns that goes crazy with raising taxes. And, um, and to your point, Jim, earlier about, you know, that we could carry a, <laughs> a 10 time bigger statutory debt. Um, I, I think we're, oh, most of the residents in this town are very happy that we're an outlier there. Um, yeah. So... Um, but thank you. Thank you for, for giving me the time to talk here. And thank you for your time. I, I appreciate everybody's effort. And, right. uh, and then I know that for, for a lot of us on the phone, it's basically a, a volunteer type of job. And, and for those that, uh, that are paid for what they do for Westfield, uh, you're, you're earning your dollars. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Bruce, you for thank, thank you very much. And just to clarify two things, um, the, um, um, I hope you saw in the presentation tonight, um, you know, how conservatively we are entering um, this 2021 budget season. Um, you know, so um, just to um, respond to your point, um, that is absolutely on our minds. We don't know what the future holds, you know, a, um, you know, a year and a half ago, um, you know, we um, thought maybe um, a cyber hack or, you know, another Sandy would be the worst thing. So, um, you know, we certainly are, you know, um, being very conservative and frankly, I think I've always been very conservative in the, you know, approach that we've taken to the budgeting. Um, and then, you know, I just, it, what we're looking for is to, to diversify our sources of revenue um, so that we're not so reliant on just taxes from residents. So that just to uh, make sure that that's clear, it's, it's not um, increasing the taxes, it's, um, diversifying the source, the, the sources of revenue that are coming into the town. But thank you very much for coming tonight um, and for your questions. Great, anyone else? Right. Jim, I can address that question from Sean Mullen about the, about the debt if you'd like. Okay, yeah, yeah, the exact number was that close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's just under twenty five million dollars. About sixteen of that is in long term debt that's been issued. Seven of it is in notes, 
and we have a, a little less than two million that was authorized but hasn't been issued as yet. Right, and and Scott, maybe um, just to give everyone an idea of what those bond anticipation notes carry in terms of interest, I think that would be good for people to know too. It, it was, we had an extremely uh, favorable sale last year. The notes mature um, this year in, in August, I believe, and it was 0.23%, I think is the rate that we got. Yeah. On, on how much? 0.23%. On, um, on 7, 7 million, 7.2 7 million almost. Oh. oh yeah, no, 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 we, and so we're, we're again. That's something else we manage again, looking to see is a note sale appropriate this year as a bond sale, and then that's also part of the discussion every year. So, uh, but yeah, that's a great point, Linda, to have Scott give that information because yeah, point two three, uh, we should borrow more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it still costs money, so we're we're course, keeping yes. all this in context. But you know, if you have to borrow money, borrowing it at point two three percent is not a bad deal. So yeah. Okay, anybody else have a question? Um, not seeing anybody. But I will, if not, I will just thank everyone for attending and coming uh, and uh, listening to us, uh, listening to me and talk too much. But uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. I know the council members do too. And, and thanks. Uh, and we'll, we'll be seeing everybody, obviously, in the next uh, two months between capital budget presentations, uh, municipal budget presentations. And uh, thanks for everyone to stay engaged. So uh, thanks very much. Yes, thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.